Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian true crime cases and today we are covering another solved case and this case made headlines for extraordinary reasons. It is the Lynette Dawson case, but you also may know it from the Teacher's Pet podcast. 1982, Lynette Joy Dawson, or Lynn, was aged 33 and born Lynette Joy Sims. She lived in the suburb of Bayview in Sydney, Australia, with her two daughters, four-year-old Chanel and two-year-old Sharon and her husband, Chris Dawson. Lynn and Chris met at a high school function, both aged just 16 years old, back in 1965. Five years later, in 1970, the pair were married. Chris, who also had a twin brother, Paul, went on to have a successful career as a professional rugby league player before going on to become a high school physical education teacher at Cromer High School in Sydney. Chris and his brother, Paul, were incredibly close. Both are described as a very charismatic, both into sports and fitness, playing football alongside each other on the same team at their own insistence, and they both did part-time modelling. Chris and Paul Dawson were very well known and very popular in Northern Sydney around this time due to their time playing professional sports together. They were pretty much mini celebrities, honestly. And at the time, they both even featured in a documentary on the ABC called Checkerboard which was about twins, and this aired in 1975. Lynn herself also made an appearance on this documentary talking about being the wife of a twin. I'll play you a few clips from the documentary so you get an idea of what it was like and about and what their, I guess, demeanor was like and what they were like, a small snippet of what they were like as people. Quite often, you'll see reflection of yourself and straight away you think, ah, it's it's the other one. Do you think it's hard on your wives to be married to twins? Well, quite often friends of friends of our wives might say, you know, what's it like sharing your husband? But uh, I think you know when when they first you've never pulled that trick on them. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Hadn't probably thought about sharing him until somebody a couple of years ago said. What is it like sharing a husband? And to me, it was just seemed so silly. So a bit about Lynette Dawson. She was described as a devoted mother who absolutely adored her two young daughters. Lynn had actually struggled to conceive for six years and was in the process of adopting before she fell pregnant with Chanel. She went on to become a nurse, a career that really matched her kind and caring nature that she became so well known for. She also worked part-time at a childcare centre. And from the outside, Chris and Lynn seemed like a happy and normal couple. They were both an attractive couple in good careers with two beautiful children. However, Lynn confided in friends at work that Chris was an angry, aggressive man behind closed doors. Many close to Lynn had seen bruises on her body, but few asked where she got them from. It really was a time back in the 1980s when people said to themselves, that's none of my business. I, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to ask. It's, it's between a husband and a wife. And on the few occasions where people would say to Lynn, where'd you get that bruise? She would defend her husband saying, oh, I just, I'm, I must have made Chris mad. I must have made him angry. But there was one person that witnessed this abuse for themselves. And that was a babysitter called Bev McNally that the Dawsons had in 1980. Bev was only a teenager at the time and actually a student of Chris Dawson's, which will become a relevant point in just a moment. Bev witnessed two separate acts of violence against Lynn from her husband before she made the decision to quit her babysitting job. So a little bit more about the twins, Chris and Paul Dawson. They actually both went on to study teaching together and become teachers at the same school together. They also both became physical education teachers. And if you couldn't already tell, Chris and Paul were pretty much like two peas in a pod. They did everything together. 
Growing up, they even had their own secret language that required therapy to basically stop this from happening and to teach them to communicate with others. The twins explained in the Checkerboard documentary that they wanted to have this language because they weren't bothered about communicating with anybody else. They were just happy to be able to talk to each other and no one else around them. So the parents had to quite literally send them to therapy to teach them how to interact with people other than the two of them. As adults, they lived in homes just hundreds of meters apart. Their relationship almost transcended best friends and brothers. They had to do everything together and be alike in every way. They were very dependent on one another. However, there was an incredibly dark side to the popular twins and their lives as teachers. They both believed one of the perks of their teaching job was the relations they could have with pretty young teenage students. At first, the pair would just scout pretty young girls to babysit for Chris and Lynn's young girls. So, for example, Bev McNally, who never had any relations with Chris, but as a pretty young 15-year-old, Chris Dawson invited her to come babysit for his two young girls, which is a little bit weird. But eventually the twins crossed a line with their students, or at least Chris did, that should have never have been crossed. In 1981, Chris Dawson began an affair with 16-year-old Joanne Curtis one of his own students. Joanne came from a troubled background, witnessing a violence in her own home between her mother and stepfather. Joanne truly believed she loved Chris and Chris was infatuated with Joanne. The pair would exchange love notes at school and Chris even proposed marriage to Joanne at one point. In October of that same year, Joanne Curtis actually moved in to the Dawson's family home when tensions in her own home became too much for her to bear. And she was in her last year of high school, so she was going through high school exams. So Chris acting like the big hero invited his lover to come stay with his family. And at this point, of course, Lynn had no idea. It Like, this is such a messed up situation. So basically, Chris and Joanne were continuing their affair under the roof of the Dawson's home while Lynn was still living there and had no idea. I just... I just can't imagine. And of course, Lynn wasn't actually happy with the idea of Joanne coming to stay with them, despite the fact that she was having troubles at home. Lynn, although she was a caring and generous woman, had her own marital problems going on and didn't feel like they should be taking on another problem. But Chris insisted that Joanne stay with them. So as I said, Chris and Joanne continued this relationship for about a month under the Dawson's family roof before Lynn cottoned on and realized what was going on with her husband and a 16 year old girl. And she actually confronted Joanne telling her, you've been taking liberties with my husband. So even at this time, we know that Lynn couldn't bear to blame her own husband, who she loved and adored. She didn't want it to be Chris's fault. She wanted to put the blame on Joanne. So of course, Lynn Dawson kicked Joanne out of their family home and Joanne went to stay with Paul, Chris's twin brother down the road because they lived so close to each other. And this affair still continued. Joanne would literally sneak back to see Chris at his home during the night or when Lynn wasn't there. And Lynn didn't know that Joanne was staying literally down the road with her own brother and, was it brother and sister-in-law? But despite this betrayal in their marriage and the fact that Lynn didn't even know the half of it really <sighs> is the worst thing. Lynn wanted to still save their marriage and she tried so hard to keep her family together. So that same year, two days before Christmas, Chris Dawson abandons his family. He leaves a note for his wife 
telling her basically she he's leaving her and asks her not to paint a bad picture of him to their children. Meanwhile, Chris was driving with 16 year old Joanne towards Queensland to begin their new life together. But Joanne was in such a panic about the situation, she began to break out in hives and insisted they turn around so she could return home. Joanne at this point was beginning to regret her choice to enter into a relationship with a married man that was twice her age and she wanted out. Due to Joanne's panic, Chris Dawson was back home within days, returning home on Boxing Day. But on New Year's Eve, Instead of being with his family, he was with Joanne Curtis. As you can imagine, this temporary disbandment of their marriage brought about a lot of tension between Chris and Lynn. They made the decision, much to the displeasure of Chris, to attend marriage counselling. They attended one session and according to those close to Lynn, she said the session went really well and things were back on track in their marriage. Lynn's work colleagues even saw Chris and Lynn holding hands when Chris came to pick her up from work because Lynn didn't drive, which was a sight they had never seen. It wasn't long after this, however, that Lynette Dawson would disappear. On January the 8th, 1982, Lynn Dawson spoke to her mother on the phone. And the one thing her mother did notice from this conversation was that Lynn sounded off. She was slurring her words. When her mother asked her what was wrong, how was she, Lynn said that her husband had made her a lovely drink. Which was odd in itself because Lynn wasn't really much of a drinker. And this phone conversation would be the last conversation that Lynn and her mother would ever have. On the phone, the pair had made plans to catch up and meet up with other family the following day at Northbridge Baths, which is a local beach. However, she never turned up to this meeting and Lynn Dawson was never seen again. Two days later, on January the 10th, Chris Dawson's teen lover, Joanne Curtis, permanently moved back into the Dawson's family home in Bayview, Sydney. Disturbingly, she soon began wearing Lynn's clothing and her wedding rings, and sleeping in the bed that Lynn had shared with Chris. Chris even had Lynn's wedding rings reset to fit Joanne's own hands. Chris and Joanne told Chris's young daughters that Lynette had never been their real mother and that 16-year-old Joanne was actually their new and real mother. Pretty much from the day that Lynn disappeared, her name was never mentioned again in the Dawson household, as, as though she never existed. Lynn's daughters did wonder as they grew up where their original mother went, always hoping she would one day return, but believing that she had chosen to leave off of her own accord. Despite this, Chanel and Sharon grew up with who they saw and believed to be a caring, fun and loving father. They saw Joanne, on the other hand, as cold and icy, which, given the circumstances of being thrown into the role of stepmom at such a young age, it's not surprising. Chris Dawson had encouraged Joanne to take on the role of a loving mother and she just couldn't do that with children that were not her own, at that age especially. The following year in 1983, Chris Dawson finalised his divorce from Lynn and married Joanne Curtis. Their marriage would last for 12 years and they would have one child together. So backtracking for just a moment, it would be a whole six weeks from the day that Lynn Dawson went missing before she was reported missing by her husband, Chris Dawson. And I can honestly not tell you why nobody else thought to report her missing because during this six week period, she was uncontactable. Not to mention the fact she didn't have a driver's license. She hadn't taken any personal possessions with her. She had no money of her own, nothing stashed away, and most 
Notably and most importantly, she had left her two young daughters behind. The daughters or the children that she had so desperately wanted. And there is just no way she would have left those girls behind. So from my understanding, friends and family of Lynette's simply believed what Chris Dawson told them. And Chris told them that Lynn had made the decision to get up and leave her life and their marriage. You see, Chris was somebody that people trusted. Chris was considered a good person, a good member of the community, and they had been married for so long. What reason would they have to not trust Chris? So I think that is the real reason why nobody reported her missing because for six weeks, people, yes, yes, my cat is here. For six weeks, people continued, for six weeks, Chris Dawson continued to tell her friends and family that she was still there until they realized she wasn't. <laughs> On February the 18th, Chris Dawson reported Lynn missing to the police, telling them he believed she had left off of her own accord after marital problems over Lynn's bank card spendings. Chris also suggested to the police that it was possible Lynn had run away to join a religious organization. Despite the fact that Lynn was not remotely religious and, and had never even attended church. Chris also placed a public notice in the newspaper that said, Lynn, I love you. We all miss you. Please ring. We want you home, Chris. Chris also told Lynn's worried friends and family that she had indeed been in contact with him and told him that she just needed time. However, those that knew Lynn knew that not only would she never leave her two children behind, it's also highly unlikely the only person that she would remain in contact with would be Chris, considering the marital problems they had had over his affair. Lynn was very close to her family and was far more likely to be in contact with them. Had she just truly needed time out of her life? However, when anyone questioned to Chris, the likelihood of a doting mother walking out on her entire family, Chris kind of had, sort of, kind of had a pretty good defense. Chris's older brother, Peter, had a mother-in-law that walked out on her entire family in the 1950s and was actually missing for several years before she resurfaced in New Zealand with a new identity. So basically any time that somebody would say to Chris, well, is it even possible for a loving, doting mother to abandon her entire family? Like, what kind of mother would do that? How is that possible? Chris would say, well, it's possible and this is what happened to my brother. Not much resulted after Lynn Dawson was reported missing in 1982 by her husband. The police had no leads, no clues and no suspects. And Chris Dawson really wasn't considered a suspect at the time. Chris did write a handwritten statement for police at the time, outlining everything he knew about Lynn's disappearance. And he wrote about the fact that he had attempted to contact people to try and find his wife. But it has come out since then that a lot of things in this statement were a lie, including the fact that he basically made no effort to contact anybody or do anything to find his missing wife. But I think far more importantly, this statement that Chris wrote for the police does not mention his extramarital affair with a 16 year old student of his. And I think if the police knew this, this would be a pretty good place to start for a motive to get rid of your wife. But Chris made no mention. No mention of the fact that Joanne Curtis moved in two days after Lynn went missing. The only thing that Chris does touch on is the fact they were having marital problems due to Lynn's bank card spendings. And I couldn't personally find any 
And I think that was evidence that Lynn had problems with bank card spendings. I don't know if this was true or if this is something that Chris just said as an excuse. In fact, an investigation into Lynn Dawson's disappearance was pretty much non-existent. Despite the fact a loving, doting mother of two young children had literally vanished into thin air with little to no explanation. Police didn't even put in enough effort to speak to people that Lynn and Chris knew. Friends, family, work colleagues, neighbours, they contacted nobody. They took Chris's word as the Bible, basically. As time passed, the case was forgotten about and the files on this case were somehow lost. Joanne Curtis did eventually go to the police after divorcing Chris and in 1999 told them some information in an interview that would temporarily respark this investigation. So investigators at this time did tap Chris and Paul Dawson's phones, but unfortunately nothing resulted. So in 2000, the decision was finally made to do a dig or an excavation of an area near the pool where the Dawsons once lived. There had been suggestions by several parties, including Joanne, that it was highly possible that Lynn Dawson was buried somewhere in that backyard. And not to mention the fact that when Chris Dawson did move out of that home and new owners moved in, Chris went to visit the new owners when he discovered they were renovating the backyard and asked them exactly where they were digging. One week after Lynn went missing, Chris Dawson put new pavings around the pool area and this is where police concentrated their dig. And this dig did uncover something and something that many would consider a significant piece of evidence. It uncovered an old pink cardigan, presumably Lynn Dawson's, with multiple cut markings on it consistent with someone that had been stabbed. Now, you would think that this discovery would have prompted a full excavation of the backyard, but it did not, not initially at least. The investigation apparently ran out of money at this point and it couldn't continue. The following year in February of 2001, a coronial inquest was finally held into Lynn's disappearance. And the coroner concluded that Lynn had had passed away, she was dead, and she had been killed by someone she knew. And they suggested that charges be laid. However, the Director of Public Prosecutions, or the DPP, concluded that there was not enough evidence to lead to a criminal conviction. A second inquest was actually held two years later in February of 2003, and the coroner recommended that Chris Dawson be charged with his wife's M-U-R-D-E-R, -E trying not to get demonetized here. But again, the DPP said there was not enough evidence to charge Chris Dawson. In 2015, a fresh investigation into Lynette Dawson's case was launched, but the difference being this time that it was not being investigated as a missing persons case, but it was being investigated as a M-U-R-D-E-R investigation. The next several years were spent gathering evidence and by April of 2018, the New South Wales Police requested that the DPP review the evidence. A month later, another extraordinary event happened that made this case reach national and even international headlines. In May of 2018, the name Lynette Dawson became synonymous with a woman that had suffered a serious misjustice, in the eyes of many. A podcast called The Teacher's Pet, written and researched by the Australian journalist Hedley Thomas, released a 16-part series on Lynn Dawson's case that included large amounts of circumstantial evidence that had not previously been heard by investigators, the public, and not even those close to Lynn. Considering how little the police did to investigate this case back in 1982, as well as the fact that files on this case have disappeared since the events took place, 
Headley Thomas had his work cut out for him. He was ultimately a one-man band of his own investigation in this case. The podcast focused on the idea that Lynn Dawson had likely been killed by her husband, Chris Dawson, back in 1982 and was potentially buried somewhere on their former Bayview property. Headley Thomas interviewed a large number of people throughout the 16-part podcast, including people investigators had not spoken to, but certainly should have spoken to, and began to gather evidence that formed a story a story of a woman that was killed by her own husband for the most selfish of reasons. The incredibly popular series received over 28 million downloads, so it's no surprise it became an incredibly popular topic of conversation last year, a massive 36 years after Lynn Dawson went missing. But the podcast has actually been taken down pending a trial, which I'll discuss in just a moment. It has been taken down just in Australia, I believe, but it's available in other countries. You can find it if you search for it, but I don't want to recommend it because it's it's been taken down for a reason. But it's such a good podcast. If you have a chance to listen to it, Highly recommend, so interesting. I have gotten so much of my information from that podcast. What I have said today, what I've said here is just a snippet of what that podcast uncovers. It is so detailed and so interesting. If you find this video interesting, please go listen to the podcast if you can. The podcast also does reveal something else incredibly disturbing, and that is somewhat of a child SEX ring that was going on in high schools in the 70s and 80s along Sydney's northern beaches and this includes the school that Chris and Paul Dawson taught at. The ring involved a handful of teachers sleeping with their own students and shockingly it's come out that many people knew that this was happening and simply accepted it or ignored it which just Oof. This is currently being investigated, I believe, so I don't have too much more to say on that. Months after the podcast's release, the Police Commissioner of New South Wales actually released a public apology for the mishandling or the initial mishandling of the Lynette Dawson case. And last September, a second dig commenced of the Dawson's former Bayview home. This dig was far larger and more complex than the previous one. They were digging deeper, they were digging a larger area of the backyard, and they were using new technologies that had not previously been used in the investigation. The owners that are now living at the Bayview property had only moved in about 18 months before this latest dig. So it was quite unfortunate timing for them, particularly as they had just renovated their backyard or they had renovated it since moving in. However, the owners did fully cooperate. Unfortunately, after a week long excavation, no new evidence resulted or none that's been made public at least. In December of last year, 2018, Chris Dawson, now 71 years old, was arrested and charged in Queensland with the death of his former wife, Lynette Dawson. He was granted bail and in June of this year, 2019, pleaded not guilty. He awaits trial at home and the trial is set for sometime next year, 2020. Chris Dawson is also facing charges relating to his relationship with a minor, his former student and ex-wife, Joanne Curtis. The impact the podcast is currently having on the case is not all positive, however. The Deputy Chief Magistrate, Michael Allen, stated back in June of this year, this is almost uncharted waters. And he added that the impact of the podcast could contribute to a risk of contamination in the upcoming trial. On the 8th of August this year, he once again stated, someone would have to be living in a cave or be naive in the extreme to perhaps ignore the potential for unfairness to a person who receives this level of media scrutiny so broadly and over this period of time. The law was there to ensure 
Guilty people were punished and innocent people set free. He also took a swipe at social media sites currently sharing the podcast which has been taken down like YouTube. Basically saying because the podcast does heavily imply Chris Dawson's guilt, it chips away at the community's confidence in the justice system for their own commercial gain. And that's where we are today, left awaiting trial and unfortunately with Lynn Dawson still missing, but it does look like closure isn't too far off for Lynn's friends and family. And I think I said at the beginning of this video, this was a solved case today. It's, it's not solved or unsolved. It's like question mark pending. So sorry about that. I feel like that was a bit misleading. Now I'm looking back. Sorry, <laughs> but regardless, I can't wait to hear your thoughts on today's video. Have you listened to the podcast? What are your thoughts on this case? Do you think this podcast has helped or hindered in this investigation? Let me know down below. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for listening to Lynn Dawson's story. And thank you to our amazing sponsor, June's Journey, for supporting content like this. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, notifications. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you soon.